uh, with our afternoon session. So we'll have a, a, a next lecture by Chris Ackers about uh, black holes and quantum error corrections. Thank you. All right, can you all hear me well? This is working, okay, good. So last time we set up this problem um, in the context of ADS-CFT where we had uh, Hilbert space of, of semi-classical gravity states in ADS and a Hilbert space of, the, of some CFT living at the boundary and there was some, we didn't phrase it this way but I would like to phrase it this way now. It's sort of a nice way of setting up the problem. There's some map V, uh, some linear map, that tells you for each ADS state, what's the dual CFT state? And in some sense, a question we're trying to answer is, what are the, you know, what is this V, and what are its properties and details? Um, you know, something that we know in principle exists, but writing down a closed form, formula for it is tricky. Uh, we can sort of do this in certain examples, um, but even when we can write it down in certain examples, and especially when we can't, we would like to understand details about it, such as uh, <coughs> the one given by this equation, where um, you know, we want to know, given some, say, bulk state psi, so this is some psi in H ADS, and some operator phi that's acting ADS. If you act that phi on the bulk state and then map it to the boundary with V, for which, you know, when, when does it, there exist some operator acting on the CFT and what does this operator look like when it exists such that this equation holds where you could have first mapped psi to the CFT with V and then acted this operator O. So, you know, this is, this is some um, compact way of asking the question we were asking last time about, you know, for which OCFT is does, uh, given some phi in the bulk, does this equation hold? You know, this, we would say that this CFT operator is reconstructing this bulk operator. And uh, I'm going to talk a lot more about equations like this as we go, but this is the, the basic question we're after. And we talked about you know, reconstructing operators and what we know about it from the extrapolate dictionary and then what people figured out uh, later, which is now called HKLL reconstruction. And these are nice, but they don't seem to be the full story. And we now think we understand more about the full story. And the start of this is the so-called quantum extremal surface formula. So let me explain that, and then I can tell you how it's related to bulk reconstruction. So the idea is that um, this formula allows you to compute the von Neumann entropy of subregions of the CFT, or the entire CFT, uh, in the case that the subregion is the whole thing. So von Neumann entropy, Yeah, v, v is a map from uh, ADS to CFT. Uh, it does not commute with O. It's, um, it's, so, it doesn't, yeah, so the uh, domain and the image are different Hilbert spaces, possibly different sizes. And so, you know, it's an interesting question, given some V, um, which O's satisfy this for a given phi? And that's, this is sort of the question we're trying to understand. So the von Neumann entropy is the following. So let's say you're given some Hilbert space, uh, HB. And on this Hilbert space, you have a density matrix uh, rho, say. The von Neumann entropy is some quantity defined as follows. We might write it like the following. So S of B with this little rho subscript equals um, minus trace of rho log rho. This is some number, and it has lots of nice properties. Is there a question? No, okay. It has lots of nice properties. You know, it's positive, definite, um, 
and it's a nice measure of how much entanglement there is between B and whatever system purifies B. Or the purification, uh, it's not very important for this, but you know, means the system for which B union that other system is in a pure state. The QES formula is the following. So the idea is, <clears throat> let's say you, uh, again, I'm gonna draw the cylinder diagram. Hopefully it's not too small. So this, uh, you're supposed to imagine, again, time is going up, and uh, we have some CFT living sort of on the, the boundary of this cylinder. So this circle might be a time slice of that CFT. And maybe I'll take uh, this purple region to be some subregion I'll call B. And I would like, you know, then the CFT is in some state that we'll call, um, we'll call capital Phi. So this, the CFT on this circle is in the state capital Phi. And there's some, uh, so the QES formula tells you how you can compute this quantity, where rho now is the reduced density matrix you get from starting with this state and tracing out B complement. So B complement is the, you know, the whole time slice is B, B bar. And um, you're gonna compute it using the dual ADS. So the formula looks like this. I'll write it and then I'll explain it. So S of B uh, in this state, um, phi, equals, actually let me write this as phi tilde for reasons that I'll explain momentarily. So the, the, the CFT state is phi tilde. Um, and it equals the area of some surface that we'll call gamma divided by 4G Newton plus the entropy of a region defined by gamma, but I'm gonna call it B. Um, so this is, I might write this as, yeah, and this would be the entropy, the von Neumann entropy of some region little b, uh, and, and a state we'll call phi without the tilde. So this will be a CFT state, this phi without the tilde will be an ADS state. And what ADS state is that? It is, so let me draw a time slice so I'm gonna draw a sort of, um, I'm just gonna pick a time slice in the bulk that ends on this circle that I drew here. So B, remember, was this region. And the idea is there exists some surface gamma that uh, is homologous to B, so it, ends on the endpoints of B, and the region, the, the homology region, bounded by B and gamma is what I'm calling little b. And the total ADS state, I'm just calling, um, I'll, I'll write it here, capital Phi ADS. So capital Phi is the bulk state, capital Phi tilde, is the dual CFT state. So I'm, I'm gonna use tildes in general to represent the CFT version of some ADS quantity. So phi bulk state, phi tilde, CFT state. And the idea is that this formula <coughs> holds when gamma is the minimal quantum extremal surface. So Q, yeah, I'm just gonna use QES to represent quantum extremal surface. So the idea is if you wanted to compute the von Neumann entropy of capital B, that could be difficult to plug it into this formula. So you could instead, if you wanted to, uh, look at the bulk dual state, find, 
you consider all surfaces gamma, which extremize this joint quantity, this sum. So when I say extremal, you're extremizing this A over 4G plus S bulk quantity. And if there's multiple gammas that extremize this quantity, you pick the one that minimizes this quantity among those. So again, it's, you're minimizing A over 4G plus S bulk, but only among the surfaces that extremize that quantity. And um, let me be a little clearer by what I mean by extremizing this quantity. I mean, you literally consider, uh, you know, gamma is defined by some uh, embedding function, so it's some surface in ADS, and you can consider local perturbations of gamma. And, and under these, lo these perturbations local to the surface, you want this quantity to be extremized with respect to those. Um, so some surfaces have this property. Uh, it's, it's a little more familiar if you forget about the S bulk term. You just try and extremize, say, the area of the surface. It's, it's uh, still formally defined, but a little harder to do in practice, although people have done it, um, to try and extremize this joint quantity. But it, it's, uh, it's, you know, that's, the, that's the prescription. So um, this is how your, this formula is supposed to hold. And uh, you know, it's, it's a very big idea. It was first written down in this form, this formula, in 2014 by Engelhardt and Wall. Um, but it comes, so it was, you know, it was conjectured to be the correct formula that you could compute the left-hand side using this right-hand side. Um, but it wasn't just conjectured out of nowhere. It evolved starting from some conjecture by Ryu and Takianagi uh, in, in 2006, which, um, which was sort of a, you know, it's a special case of this. So Ryu Takianagi sort of uh, didn't, didn't talk about this term, and it wasn't, and their formula said this equals this term for the minimal surface, which is true, but only in time symmetric situations where you don't have to consider extremizing also in the time direction. Um, so, there, and so starting from this paper, there was a series of generalizations climaxing in this one. And uh, since then, our trust in this formula has only grown because uh, for sort of for two reasons. One is that people have come up with derivations of this formula using the ADS-CFT dictionary. Um, so some people like to put derivations there in quotes because you know, the, the, it's not like a proof of this formula because we haven't proven certain aspects of the, the, the dictionary that were used. But there are very plausible assumptions that went into deriving this formula. Uh, the other reason people like this formula, perhaps, perhaps the main reason, is that um, people have used it to compute answers to questions that we really like. So it, it turned out to give us answers that we really like, so therefore, it's probably true. Um, and this is, this is sort of the, the logic behind these like, 2019 page curve calculations. If you've heard of those, maybe I'll be able to mention them later. But they you know, used this formula to compute the page curve. So if you tried to compute the entropy, the entropy of the Hawking radiation, Using this formula, where you know, B here is now the Hawking radiation, uh, uh, you compute it using this QES formula, you get the page curve, whereas if you had just computed it sort of the naive way, you wouldn't have gotten the page curve, you would have gotten the so-called Hawking curve where the entropy goes up and up and up and you get an information problem. Um, anyway, so this, this formula gives you the page curve, that's really nice, so now I would say it's very uh, trusted. Yeah, the second term is supposed to be divergent, right? Yes, good. Yeah. Uh, let me comment on that. Thank you. So the second term, uh, you know, because the bulk is a quantum field theory, von Neumann entropies and quantum field theories are divergent. So the idea, actu the, the idea actually is that this quantity together is more well-defined than either separately. 
and that this 1 over g Newton, uh, the, the bare 1 over g Newton is also infinite, but is the counter term, includes the counter term with the divergence here, so that the joint, the, the sum is actually some well-defined finite thing is the idea. Um. So in string theory, the bare g Newton is finite. Good, right. uh-huh. Yeah, and then, and then I guess the... The second the one, it's not clear if it's finite, right? Uh, I would, so in string theory, I would hope that probably you would, you would end up getting finite answers from the, what you would in that context call the bulk entropy. Probably you would. Uh, I see, okay, yeah. so you think that it will be finite? Yeah, I think it would be finite, okay. yeah. Very simple one. Um, I'm a little uncomfortable with the definition of a quantum extremal uh, surface because basically it seems to me that you have this quantity which you identify with an entropy and then you take the minimum of an entropy and usually we take the maximum of an entropy. So can you explain this uh, oddity? Why is um, that? So I, yeah, these contexts where you take maximums of an entropy, probably maybe what you're thinking of is some coarse graining procedure where you say, have some data about a state and you pick the state that maximizes the entropy with respect to that coarse grained data. That, that's different from what we're doing here. So we're, we're, all of these are in some sense fine grained quantities where um, you know, we're not throwing anything away. This is, we're keeping all the data. Uh, yeah, so it is an interesting question why the minimum shows up here. You know, why is it the minimal quantum extremal surface um, rather than the largest one? Uh, this is one that, this is a question that interested me for a long time. And in fact, one of the theorems we'll get to uh, is trying to explain exactly this. Yeah, like, what's the idea behind why it's a minimum? Yeah. Yeah, can you also ask a question? I, I think you said that then uh, the error, the combination error plus the entropy of the of the fields in, in small b is finite, but I guess in general, um, an entropy in the CFT should be infinite. No, I mean, good. you always have a cutoff. Yes, so you're saying, good. Yeah, this is UV finite, but not IR finite. Uh, because oh, this area easy. goes all the way out to infinity, it actually diverges, and the, this diverges because you know, there's infinite area as you go out, and it's this IR divergence on the right-hand side that matches the UV divergence you get on the left-hand side. I see. Yeah, so it's a very interesting thing. Uh, people have understood in many contexts this sort of UVIR relationship between the two sides, yeah. Very, very simple question. Uh, given the, the region of small b, how to compute the bulk entropy? Yeah, so you, uh, you have to just use your favorite scheme for computing the bulk entropy. Uh, so this, this is formally the answer. Um, I think what you're getting at is, I said in some sense this could help you compute the left-hand side, but we've just, we also have an entropy on the right-hand side, so it doesn't seem very helpful. That's true. It was, it was very helpful when it, well, like in the Rita Takinagi version, when we didn't have to worry about this. Um, now that we have this guy, we've just swapped computing that for this. That said, um, sometimes it is easier because, you know, when this is a strongly coupled theory, this can be a weakly coupled theory, and so, uh, there, there might be techniques available to weakly coupled theories. Uh, another reason it might be useful is that um, if you consider, if you want an answer that's in, from the CFT point of view in like a one over n expansion, from the bulk point of view, some G Newton expansion, this term ha being divided by G Newton is uh, very large in the semi-classical limit that G Newton is very small. Whereas this term in general, well, we will consider situations where it can be very large, like it's an entropy of a black hole, but often you can take this to be the entropy of some matter excitations, which is order one in, uh, in, in this G Newton expansion. So, so this is a subleading correction to this guy, which is, and he's easy to compute. But that said, uh, it's not in general a simplification, it's just the formula that uh, was given to us by ADS CFT, and it turns out that it's going to be useful for talking about reconstruction uh, precisely because uh, there's an entropy on both sides, actually. Do, do you need quite detailed information about the bulk, right? Because, I mean, uh, in the, in the Ryu Takanagi formula, uh, you just need, like, the metric, uh, you, uh, and it's a, like, geometric information. Here, you need to compute something. Uh, yeah, it's much harder. This is much harder to yeah. use. Um, much harder to use. I think when it was originally written down, uh, yeah, that's 
Netta and Aaron thought that no one would ever be able to actually compute to the left-hand side. Um, I think that's why it was kind of a, no one would ever be able to compute it in a situation that was much more complicated than some expansion. Um, I think that's why it was so surprising in 2019 when people actually used this, and, and this effect was very important, this term was very important, to compute something interesting. Is it clear that gamma is unique? Uh, no, yeah, good, so it's not. So in general, there will be multiple gammas that extremize the right-hand side. Sure. Um, and sometimes there are multiple that have very, you know, you can get in situations where it's degenerate, which one's minimal. Maybe that's what you're getting at. Yeah, yeah. Um, in those situations, this formula receives corrections that are in general, um, in general order one, so, so like subleading to this leading guy, but maybe of the same order as this guy, um, but, in, in, but generically it can be very large, even one in Virginia. So, so this formula actually should be, is not exact, it's always an approximate formula with uh, non-perturbative corrections here, and these add up in a conspiratorial way, whenever there's another gamma that's very close to the one that you're considering. Uh, not close position-wise, but close in this value. And, um, they, and those corrections can be very large in general. And um, so, so some of the lessons were, that's gonna be very important for some of the lessons we'll draw later. For the first lessons, you're actually segueing perfectly into what I wanted to say next. Um, this formula and what it says about reconstruction were first understood in a context where we don't have to worry about this degeneracy, where we can just, which is, which is pretty generic, you know, most situations only have one gamma, that's uh, the minimal QES, and others are very far away from it in this value. In those situations, there's a, a nice theorem that I'll write down that explains exactly uh, what this formula tells you about reconstruction. So maybe I'll say that right now, uh, unless there's more questions. These are great, great questions. So, so, the quantum extremal surface formula's lessons are easiest to understand and were first understood in a restricted context, which will be the context for this lecture. And this restricted context is what I'll call a fixed QES subspace. Uh, I want to be so clear about what this context is that I'm going to write the whole definition. So it's a subspace of the bulk Hilbert space. So sometimes when I say subspace, people think I mean some region of ADS, like some region of this diagram here. I don't mean that. I mean literally a subspace of the Hilbert space of bulk states. So something like the vacuum state plus the first however many uh, excited states. A subspace of HADS in which the position of the quantum extremal surface is approximately the same in every state in that subspace. So, um, I hate to erase this because maybe some of you have already copied this down. I'm just gonna say subspace, I don't know, let's call it S um, of HADS such that the position of the QES is approximately the same in every state psi in S. 
um, by approximately, I mean, it doesn't have to literally be, this, be the same exact position, but the fluctuations in its position will be small relative to all scales of interest in the problem. So uh, in particular, I'm going to be OK. We'll consider situations where the deviations in the position are like of order Planck length. Um, and these subspaces are easy to find. It's not excessively restrictive. Um, because, for example, if you consider like vacuum ADS at all the states you can obtain by acting some order one number of light matter operators, it will be one of these subspaces. Um, and this is what people sort of meant for a long time whenever they said words like, let's consider a code subspace, um, if you've heard that phrase. Um, so, so, you know, in the subspace S, I don't want there to be black hole states and vacuum ADS, things with macroscopically different geometries. I do want just like one, basically one background, like the vacuum ADS background, plus maybe some small perturbations on top of that. Um, and you can construct these subspaces. And the reason why, like, let me just say in words, if you start with vacuum ADS and um, you know, if I draw, this is a time slice of vacuum ADS where I, where I have some sub, subregion B. Well, I didn't say this here, but when I say fixed QES subspace, um, I really mean with respect to some subregion B of the boundary. Uh, so, you know, it, it has some quantum extremal surface. Maybe this quantum extremal surface gamma is the minimal QES uh, in this, say, uh, vacuum geometry. And however many you know, light excitations I put, if I just put an order one number of them, they're not going to change the position very much because they're just going to back react uh, and change the metric sort of a higher order in G Newton. And you know, the surface is extremal, um, so it's going to be an even higher order in G Newton correction to its position. Um, and ultimately, it's if you just put like an order one number, so, so not scaling with G Newton, number of excitations, uh, the geometry is not going to change very much, and the position won't change by more than uh, order Planck length or so. And we're only going to consider, um, for now, reconstructing operators that are maybe uh, here. They, I'm going to consider some phi here and ask, can I reconstruct it in this subregion B? Um, and then this phi I'm going to take to be further away from the QES than a Planck length. So this distance will be much larger than this Planck length. So these fluctuations in the position aren't going to concern us or change the answer. <laughs> Later on, we're going to worry a lot about lifting this assumption of working in these subspaces. But yeah. I have a question. Uh, so by this definition, do you mean that all the states in S have the same geometry? Or you admit states with different geometry, but such that the curve is, the sa is still the same? Uh, yeah, let me do the more conservative option of having the same geometry at leading order in G Newton. So I'm going to consider metrics that can take some G Newton expansion. And at the, the first piece of that, the, like the G0 piece, will be the same. But then the higher orders, the ones that come proportional to G Newton or G Newton squared, those can be different. Okay, so I have sort of a general question but about uh, uh, systematic expansion for this formula, meaning if you are going to ignore order one, I mean, if all the order one fluctuations are going to amount to the same uh, quantum surface, does it really make sense to include order yes. one correction yes. in that? Good, 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 yeah. So um, it's, I will take into account how these order one excitations change the area. And 
what they won't do in a way that will matter for this problem is change the position. So, so um, yeah, this is, this is important. So, um, because the area in this formula comes enhanced with this division by G Newton, a change in the area at order G Newton will, as you're saying, will show up in this formula at order one. Those, I will take into account those effects. Um, and so it will be consistent with me to add order one uh, contributions from this guy. Um, but the, the position won't change at that order. Uh, because, um, and the position I'm not considering any sort of G Newton expansion where it's enhanced by G Newton. The, uh, yeah, so if you make some metric perturbation, the, you could imagine the area changes sort of from two effects. Uh, one contribution is that, at leading order in this perturbation, the position is changing in the background metric, and the other contribution is that the metric is changing at the current position, and um, Both will contribute to this A over 4G at order one, but the position, yeah, what do I want to say? Yeah, uh, what I want to say is that um, if you take this background metric and you add perturbations to it, that are proportional to G Newton. Um, those can change the position of the surface uh, a little bit, so proport like in, in, in an amount proportional to G Newton. But I'm only gonna I, I'm I'm gonna consider scales of the problem, like trying to reconstruct operators that are sufficiently far from it, like some order one distance, that this this change in position by order G Newton won't matter for the question of is this guy still inside gamma or is he outside. Uh, that, yeah. yeah, but the, and the correction term will matter. Somehow. The correction term will matter to this one. Yeah, I will add those in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. So it's in this context that an amazing theorem holds, and there's sort of a long list of papers that built up this theorem. Um, and I'll put them all in the lecture notes, but this theorem in its, its form that I'm gonna write it was written down in this paper by Daniel Harlow in 2016. Uh, so it's sort of, this paper takes the developments from some previous work over the couple years prior to this, adds in one piece and then writes it all as one nice theorem. And um, so I'll write it. Let me say, this theorem is worded for simplicity in terms of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. This is the context that, this is how this theorem was written here. Uh, and you might worry yeah, you might worry that this doesn't apply to ADS-CFT because um, both have infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, like the CFT is some field theory, uh, and that's a valid concern. So um, there's two ways you might think about this. One is you could just place both theories sort of on a cutoff. So, you know, you could um, put your CFT on a lattice, and then um, this formula would apply, this theorem would apply there. Uh, and I don't think you would lose anything qualitative about what we want to learn by doing that. Um, but if you want, you could also use the more appropriate language without placing any cutoff uh, of working with these infinite von Neumann algebras. And you could ask, does a theorem like the one I'm about to write hold in this infinite von Neumann algebra setting? And the answer is uh, yes. So this theorem as I'm going to write does hold the infinite von Neumann algebra setting. There have been a number of nice papers that came out after 2016 that generalized it to the setting um, by 
Tom Faulkner and Monica Kang and David Kolchmeyer and others. Um, so the, the basic philosophy, so nothing qualitatively seemed to change when they, when they took this theorem and rewrote it in that context and generalized it to that context. So my philosophy is going to be to present to you the, simple, the simpler to understand one that's about finite dimensional Hilbert spaces and just tell you if you want that it should, it, this one generalizes to that context. Theorems I write later are not yet generalized to that context, but I expect that they could be. Um, but my philosophy for presentation will be just show you the, the finite one. It's easier to understand. Okay, so the idea is we're going to let H be some Hilbert space that factorizes. Uh, and this Hilbert space you should regard as like the CFT Hilbert space. So I'm going to draw a picture here to sort of guide the eye for what this theorem means. So H is like the, so this is like some uh, circle that's like the time slice of the CFT. And B might be this subregion. And then B bar is the complementary subregion. Okay, so there's this Hilbert space. And there's also uh, a second Hilbert space, which we'll call H code. It's called H code for historical reasons that will become clear as we go. And it also is imagined to factorize into H little b tensor H little b bar. This you should think of as like the um, fixed QES subspace S. Um, this is a subspace of H ADS. And this is like morally going, little b is going to be that region contained between the quantum extremal surface and B, and little b bar will be its complement. And both of these will take to be finite dimension uh, Hilbert spaces. And also we're gonna let V, just like in the ADS CFT setting, be a map from H code to H. Then the claim is that the following two statements are equivalent. I don't think I'll have enough room to write both, but let me write one of them here. So the first is some statement about operator reconstruction. And it's, um, it's this statement. For all phi b and respectively uh, phi prime of b bar, so phi prime is just a different phi. It's not like some derivative of phi or anything. There exists an operator O B. So this is an operator on capital B, and uh, respectively O prime B bar. such that for all states psi in H code, the following equation holds. So let me write it here. That OB V psi equals V phi B psi. And, uh, and also 
the analogous thing when you replace um, b and b bar and little b and little b bar. And, with the, and you have to put the primes on there, I guess, as I've written it. Um, and then also with the Hermitian conjugates there. Yeah. Just a quick clarification. So each H code is a subspace of H alias or the image of H? I mean, is H code the same as S? H code is the, is the same as S. Okay. Yeah. Not its image. It's really a subspace of H alias. Yes. I, yeah, and I, I think I know why you're asking this question because sometimes people take it to mean the image. Yeah. I'm taking it to mean this, but uh, yeah. So, yeah, sometimes people say, oh, well, they're isomorphic, so I might as well mean the image. And uh, that, I think that's fine, but that's not what I mean. Yeah. Have factorized the space in the gravitational side? Yes, I have factorized both. And I think what, what you're pointing out is that this is a sort of illegal thing to do uh, in, in gravity and also in um, quantum field theory. But I'm taking both. So, at the level of this theorem, I'm just defining these to be factorizing Hilbert spaces. And you can take this to be a model for ADS CFT. And you could you know, then ask, after I finish writing this theorem, well, does this hold when I make this and this more realistic Hilbert spaces? And uh, the answer is yes, people have generalized this to those settings. But um, all, nothing qualitatively changes, so it's easier to understand here. We have uh, two conformal filter in the left and in the right, but uh, HB uh, tensor to HB bar uh, uh, is for one conformal filter or? Yes, right now uh, I'm not thinking about having two separate boundaries and two separate CFTs. I just have this one CFT living on this circle. Huh. And uh, yeah, I've factorized it into B and B complement. Yeah. And so. The statement here of condition one, I haven't finished the theorem, so you know, the whole point of the theorem is that this is equivalent to a second statement. But this statement says that you know, this region little b, any operator here can be reconstructed by an operator on capital B. And also any, any operator and little b bar can be reconstructed on capital B bar. And so I need to write the second. So let me... Um, Sorry, um, yeah. maybe this is the same question that Atish asked, but I didn't understand. So is, is B injective in this, in this theorem, or B can be a anything? Sorry, I, I did not say that. Um, this V and this theorem is an isometry. So uh, yeah, it's every guy. So there's a unique, yeah, there's a, there's a certain image here. Uh, it's, it's not one to one. It's, uh, this, this could be much bigger than this, uh, yeah. So this has some image. Uh, by isometry, I mean all of the inner products are preserved. OK. Uh, yeah, so like I could write it. Um, sorry. So an isometry on the, on the image. It's, uh, yeah, let me, let me, sorry, if I can write it here, yeah. So it's like for all psi in H code. Oh, OK, so on the image only. Yeah, psi v dagger v psi equals psi psi. So it doesn't change the inner products. Um, and this is only possible if H is at least as big as H code. But it could be much bigger. Yeah. OK. So yeah, I'm, let me, to write the second condition, erase this picture um, and just gesture maybe to this one. So this is little b and this is little b bar. So it's the same picture. Sort of, I just. I need to commandeer the room. So the second condition in this theorem, the one that's equivalent to one, is that there exists some operator a hat that acts on H code. such that for all density matrices on H code, the following equation holds. And it's, it's, some, it's supposed to remind you of the QES formula. 
So if you wanted to compute, so if you took rho and you mapped it to um, the state, you know, the, the dual CFT state, you would write that as v rho v dagger. This v, you know, acts on the ket part of rho to send it to the, the boundary, like the CFT Hilbert space, and the v dagger acts on the bra part of rho to do that. So this is like the CFT version of rho. And this equals, <coughs> this is like the expectation value of a hat, uh, which you know, morally you should think of as, this is like the a over 4g. Uh, and then pl uh, plus s of little b in the state rho. And then this is supposed to be like exactly the same thing. This is like the s bulk term. It looks so similar, I'm not even gonna bother saying what it's like. So this is supposed to be, uh, and, and also, likewise, when you replace b and b bar, and little b and little b bar. So this is the second condition. I've now fully written it. So, what you should, so the point is that um, if you took some state defined on H code, that defines some state on H um, by, by mapping it to H with V. And then now you can compute the von Neumann entropy of this factor, say, and it would equal this thing, so you could, you know, this is a formula that you can use, it's like a, like a bulk formula, or like a formula using quantities from H code. And, you know, this A hat doesn't depend on the state. That's so important that I'll write it. So let me circle this A hat. Sorry if, if it is getting jumbled. I just want to say that this depends on V. If you change v, it, depend, it changes what the a hat operator is. But a hat does not depend on rho. It's independent of rho. So this is, you know, that's just like, you know, the operator that measures the area of the QES uh, is, is it's some operator. It's independent of the state. Right? Like, uh, its expectation value can change in different states, but it's some operator. And uh, this is supposed to look like, I mean, it's supposed to be the QES formula. Um, let me make a comment later about that relationship. Um, so what this theorem is supposed to tell you is that take a context like ADS CFT now where we know something like this holds, then we can learn that one is true. So if we you know, have some... Um, Situation where we had we had our subregion B, and then we could find its quantum extremal surface gamma. Then we could learn what this theorem is telling us is that any operator that's in this homology region between B and gamma can be reconstructed using just capital B. That's the lesson, uh, which is a nice lesson because. You know, the HKLL formula told us something like, uh, you know, using the Rindler reconstruction version, you can use, you can find an operator on B that reconstructs any operator that's in the, the causal wedge. Um, this, the region defined by the quantum extremal surface is at least as large as the causal wedge. Almost always bigger. So the causal wedge might be something like this. Um, this, da this dash line, the quantum extremal surface will be outside of it generally. So some operator like this, phi, that lies between them. This tells us that there is, there must be a way to reconstruct phi using just B, whereas we, and, and HKLL didn't do that for us. So, you know, it wasn't giving us everything. This is telling us there's more you can do. And the amazing thing is that this tells you not just that there must be a way to reconstruct all the way up to gamma, there's no way to do better. 
It's not, no one's going to later figure out that there's some way, if you're really clever, to, to you know, if there's some operator question. here. Sorry. Yeah. Um, like you, you said that you're restricting to cases where this gamma only shifts by a Planck length, mm -hmm. and operators which are much more than a Planck length from gamma. So, like, can you really say for sure that you can now reconstruct operators that are like further than this uh, causal boundary if you're only allowing that causal boundary to move by a Planck length and you consider operators that are more than a Planck length away from Yeah, it. yeah, good question. So this distance, so this boundary of the causal wedge and where the QES is are generally extremely far apart, macroscopically far apart. So there's an, an enormous, like, uh, not at all related to the Planck length region with, that this is telling you, you can reconstruct operators in. Um, and the, the scale of the wiggles of the QES are, are very small in this picture. So, uh, yeah. And yeah, what, what I wanted to say was that this theorem is very nice because it's, these are equivalent. It's not just like, if, it's not just like two implies one. One also implies two. What that means is if there was some operator here by prime, uh, if you could just cook up a reconstruction scheme that allowed you to represent phi prime as an operator on B, that would contradict this theorem. Because this theorem tells you, um, it's saying, you know, whatever the region is that you can reconstruct, that's the region that shows up in this S of little b. So, so whatever, you know, so if you can reconstruct operators here at this point, then this point better have been included in the, you know, this bulk part of the QES formula. So it's an if and only if, and that's why it's so nice. It's, it's giving us a guarantee about exactly what region of the bulk your subregion can reconstruct. It's, th it's this region bounded by the QES and no more. I'm sorry. Yeah. Since I'm still a little bit confused, so are you saying that since the theorem doesn't really characterize, I mean, fixed big uh, capital B, the theorem doesn't really characterize what is small b. Are you saying that if uh, small b is a little bit different than what you draw there, then, for example, statement one, you would never be able to find uh, a v map that does what you want? Is this what you're saying? Ah, uh, no. So, <coughs> good. So the setup includes a v. So v is given to us in the setup. So I could and also choose a different small b than this one. Yeah, good. So let's say you chose a different, like, yeah, so let's say, um, yeah, you, you're looking at this theorem and you're saying, let's, let's imagine, let me use a different color, some uh, orange region, orange region here, it's smaller than gamma. It's Again? Also a different region. I mean, B is not really characterized in the theorem. So you just say that H code has, is, uh, B, uh, can be factorized. So it can, it can also take a completely different B, a small B, no? A different, a different small B, you're saying. Yeah, you're, like, you're saying like maybe this region here. This could be something small. Something like this, yes. Yeah. So what happens is if you, can, if you take this to be your small B, mm -hmm. neither one or two will be satisfied. Okay. And so, and so that satisfies the theorem because it's like, yeah. They either both have to be satisfied or both not satisfied. Okay. Yeah. So it just so happens that the uh, they're both it's they're both satisfied only in the situation where little b is exactly the region bounded by the QES. Okay. Yeah. Which still is not correct. Like, yeah, it, it, it really means that if I take just a, a, a different small b, then. Like, uh, even the first statement doesn't make any sense. Like, I cannot find this B. It, yeah, so if you take, yeah. So this gamma doesn't, yeah, I think what you're getting at is gamma doesn't show up here. I never wrote exactly. gamma. Exactly. So gamma here is characterized by, it's just in this theorem implicitly as defining the only little B in which one and two are both satisfied. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, so this segues very nicely into a point I wanted to say. So, thing. so the point is, I've written this and I've said this is like the QES formula and it tells you exactly the region you can reconstruct. 
Um, but you could complain because the QES formula that we wrote over there really has this condition that's important. It says gamma has to be something that extremizes this quantity. And among those, it minimizes this quantity. And I didn't write anything about extremizing or minimizing here. And that's true. The, uh, the reason it doesn't show up actually comes from the kind of restrictive assumption that we made where we were in this fixed QES subspace. So the QES gamma, the minimal QES gamma, is just always the same for every state. So it's just sort of implicit in the theorem. There doesn't have to be any extra condition or wording about how you find gamma given a certain state. Um, there's going to be a theorem two that I'm going to write down next lecture uh, that lifts this assumption. So it's just the same theorem lifting this assumption, which is very important because this doesn't allow us to talk about black holes very well. So we want to talk about black holes. We lift this assumption. This theorem changes, and you have to include now a condition that tells you it's going to be the minimal surface. And that's going to, so there's going to be a way to characterize gamma explicitly. Thanks. Uh, can we understand this as just a theorem about uh, finite dimension Hilbert spaces? Yes. Uh, yeah, so if you could explain that, uh, it seems to me that the operator A hat would be trivial in, the, in this case. Yeah, so, yeah, good. So I've. Uh... In that, right, if you. The two entropies will just agree. You don't need trace rho A hat for finite dimension. Uh, 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 well, uh, this term will be non zero. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, ah, so okay. Yeah, we could. Yeah, so you're saying let's take a Hilbert space and a subspace of it. Yeah. And let's calculate. Yes. Yeah. Right. So yeah. So yeah. Can you give an example? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is an example I was uh, hoping to get to, um, but maybe it'll be very it'll be informative for me to do it right now. So. Um, So, yeah, a very simple example of this is the, the, the so-called three Q-trick code. And this is a code, this is a, a quantum error correcting code, and, you know, code is showing up just like H code over there, where um, the idea is you have one three-dimensional Hilbert space, and uh, this H is nine-dimensional. So it's like we are um, embedding one Qtrit into three Qtrits. And I can tell you, so to finish telling you the setup, I need to tell you what the V is, the map between them. And um, it's defined by saying uh, zero, goes to uh, 0, 0, 0, plus 1, 1, 1, plus uh, 2, 2, 2. I'm using a, a basis for this that's like three Qtrits, so th three three-dimensional systems. Uh, and then I have to tell you, um, sorry, and this is also divided by 1 over square root 3. And then 1 goes to, uh, I have written down, but it's something, it's 0, 1, 2, uh, and then some permutation. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to, let me get the exact thing. I, I was gonna go through this uh, anyway, so this is a good time. Um, yeah, zero, one, two, plus one, two, zero, plus two, zero, one, also divided by square root three. And then two gets embedded as 0, 2, 1, plus 1, 0, 2, plus 2, 1, 0. And um, so you can check that this is an isometry. So all, you know, the, the left-hand side guys are all orthogonal, of course. 
the right-hand side guys also are. And so this is some three-dimensional subspace of the full 27, sorry, did I say nine? I meant 27, sorry, because it's three cubed. So this is some three-dimensional subspace of the full 27-dimensional <coughs> Hilbert space. Um, and <coughs> the point is that, um, well, there's a lot I could say about this. Let me, for now, just say the thing that directly answers uh, your question, which is, so, so this V, to be clear, was a map that I might, I might say is like a map from some Qtrit Q into map uh, into a H A tensor H B tensor H C and in particular maps any state psi which you know in general is like this is a general way of writing a state psi maps it into some you know, by V goes to some state psi tilde on ABC. With the same coefficient CI, but now I'll write it as um, I tilde. So, so this guy here, let me define as zero tilde, uh, one tilde, and so on, and two tilde. So this, so V embed state psi into ABC like this. And then now the question is, um, so, okay, so I claim that if you take, uh, say, A and B, both one and two are satisfied in the following sense. That, uh, so for example, first let's see two. Yeah, so my decomposition is, uh, I wanna call this first guy A, this second Q trip B, and then this third one C. Uh, sorry. Ah, uh, yes, so H sub little b, uh, th this is like h sub little b. And then now I want to take, um, like, so I used b in both cases. Sorry, that's going to be a bit confusing. Um, I want a b to be what I was calling b there, and I want c to be what I was calling b bar there. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so I might make this, maybe, maybe a picture clarifies it or not, but if I were to make, draw this like ADS CFT, so this is like a, like a time slice, I might try and put uh, HQ, so Q is like, some Q trait in the middle of ADS, and then uh, A is like this region, B is like this third, and then C is like this guy. And then I wanna take, what I'm doing in that language is taking these two and calling them, calling them what I was calling B. Yeah, yeah. B boundary. Sorry for the notational ugliness. Um, and so my claim is that in this model, um, with this choice of capital B, both one and two are satisfied, um, you know, with Q as like, like little b.
so that means, in particular, that if you were to compute the entropy of A, B in any state, uh, in any state psi tilde, that it would equal the trace of rho times some area operator plus the entropy of this little q in psi. So this is my claim. And my claim is that this is not zero, it's actually log three uh, for any state. What is this will be bar? I mean, the, so in yeah, little b bar in this example is trivial. It's trivial, it's I trivial. see. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is my claim. Uh, let me try and just give you some intuition for why it's true, maybe without going through the full proof. So the intuition is that um, you know, you have these i tildes for each i, as we wrote over there, and there's a very non-trivial fact about v's like this, which is also true of v's like the ADS-CFT dictionary. Um, the non-trivial fact is that there exists some unitary, it's a unitary operator that acts just on A, B, so it's, so it's trivial on C, that puts this I tilde, you know, when, when you act, I hope this is not too small, U, A, B acting on any I tilde equals I times some chi, where this I is on the A register, and then this chi is some fixed state. It actually, here is the maximally entangled state uh, between B and C. So this is, this is an inc incredibly non-trivial claim that I, if I have time, I don't know if I will, uh, when did I start? Yeah, definitely won't have time. Uh, I, I would prove this. There exists a U that does this. Um, and so the idea is that uh, if you want to compute the von Neumann entropy of A and B, acting a unitary on A and B doesn't change the answer. So you could take the reduced density matrix rho AB, conjugate it by any unitary you want, in particular this one, and then it would put it into this form, and this chi guy will factor out, because he doesn't depend on I. And so then when you compute the entropy of AB, you're going to get the entropy in uh, A, which will just be whatever the entropy of Q was, because he just inherits the, uh, the state of Q, plus the entropy of B, which in B is just maximally entangled with C, and uh, that's what shows up here is this extra term. So this, so, so this is all sort of trying to be a big answer to your question. Where does this guy come from and why is it D zero? And the answer is that in general when you have isometries like this, um, there's just, you know, you're tacking on some extra part of the Hilbert space, some extra factor. And that extra factor can carry entanglement. And that's the area piece. Can I just ask one thing? Yeah. So if B bar is trivial, then that SB is zero, is that right? Uh, if, if little B bar is trivial, Ah, good. So I, uh, it could be zero if the bulk was in a pure state, but I could also take some state in which Q was, say, in a mixed state, and then. I see. So it mixed with something else. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Three. Can I ask a question? Uh, I've not understood whether the theorem one assumed the existence of of V before uh, stating the theorem, or V is part of the statement of the theorem? It assumes the existence of this V. So it's, that's, that's the structure uh, that's input to the theorem. But so I'm a bit confused about the content of, uh, of the part one of the theorem. Yeah. Because if, if V is, uh, is injective, is in, is, in a, is in a isomorphism with the image, yeah. so I could just define OB as V phi V inverse, and... Uh, that would, in general, give you an operator on B and B bar. Uh, this is an operator on the image 
of, of V. But then yes. it, this is a finite dimensional but Hilbert space. So. It's, a, it's an operator on the image of V, but this operator only has support on this factor. That's the non-trivial content of one. Hmm. Is that you, you can do it acting just on one oh, factor, okay. not the whole. I see. Yeah. Okay. So the, the non-trivial content is that the operator which I define in this way uh, is not supported on, on the full H, but only on the, on the left factor. That's right. That's right. Okay. So this, the, the content here is okay. that um, this operator phi can be reconstructed in just the subregion. You don't need the whole... Can I ask, so basically, V doesn't respect the decomposition necessarily. Is this the point? V doesn't respect f free composition. Is that what you said? The, the decomposition into H, B tensor, H, uh, B bar. Uh, like uh, if you map H, B, little b, with V, um, you don't know where it lands. That's right, yeah. Because V, in general, yeah, it acts on these two guys together and does something uh, who knows what. Right. Uh, yeah. So let me um, back a little bit. So one thing I want to say is there's this theorem that we've been discussing. And um, it has a very important implication. Let me try and convey the idea of this in the next few minutes. So the idea which I've sort of already alluded to by talking about this example that is a quantum error correcting code, uh, will be that quantum error correction is important for talking about properties of this V, this, this holographic map. That if we, want, you know, if we want to understand how the holographic map has the properties it has, a nice way of doing that is using the language of quantum error correction. And the idea is the following. So what we've learned here is that if you have some, this is a time slice, if you have some subregion capital B of the boundary, and uh, let's, uh, let's say we're starting in the vacuum state or something, this is its QES. Uh, if you have an operator inside, you can find a reconstruction on capital B. If you have an operator outside, say this phi here, you can't find a reconstruction on capital B, uh, but you could find a reconstruction on this region, B bar. Now let's divide it into thirds, just for fun. So maybe I'll call this B, this A, and this C, and now it's gonna look a lot like this. This example is sort of a model for what we're about to learn. So the idea here is that, you know, just like we said before when we just had B, you know, B can't reconstruct phi alone, A can't reconstruct phi alone, and C can't reconstruct phi alone. I've drawn all of their quantum extremal surfaces. But, if you took, say, A and C, their quantum extremal surface, so the quantum extremal surface of the union of A and C is this guy. It's the same as B. Um, so, you, so A and C together can reconstruct phi, but not either individually. Uh, the same is true for A and B. They can reconstruct phi together, but not individually. Also B and C. So, there's, so no one can reconstruct phi, but any two can. This is actually a big deal. Uh, sorry, maybe, maybe I can just have two extra minutes. Uh, so, so if we let the reconstructions be OAB, OBC, and OAC, um, you could ask, uh, are these the same operator in the CFT or are they not? And, um, Assume, for the sake of contradiction, that they are the same. So they all are the same operator O in the CFT. Uh, then you can derive a contradiction by saying, well, OAB clearly commutes with any local CFT operator, I'll write it as capital Phi, um, because they're, they're just on different factors. They're space-like from each other. And likewise, OBC clearly commutes with any operator here. So this might be phi C. This would be phi uh, A. And OAC commutes with any operator on B. If they were all the same, then this would be an argument 
if you're careful about it, it would be an argument that tells you that this operator commutes with every local operator in the CFD. And that's a problem because by very rigorous arguments, using Schur's lemma, it would tell you that this operator must be proportional to the identity, which is bad because we don't think that all of the bulk operators are trivial and proportional to the identity. You know, we think that there are bulk operators that don't commute with each other, for example. Um, so that would be a contradiction. So this tells us that we shouldn't think of all bulk operators, sorry, we shouldn't think of these three as the same. They're all different reconstructions of the same bulk operator. Um, so this is, a, so how, why is this? Why did, uh, how, how did we end up learning that, you know, one bulk operator has different representations in the CFT? Um, the, the lesson is supposed to be, let me just say it, uh, the resolution is that we should only expect these operators, yeah, they're different CFT operators, they're the same acting on this subspace that we started with. So what we we're calling H code, or this, uh, this S, which is this fixed QES subspace. You should regard these O's as all being reconstructions of phi that do the right thing when acting within S. We are not guaranteed by this theorem or anything that these operators are the same or do the same thing when acting on states outside of S. So they're, they're the same when you've restricted your attention to just this subspace, S. Um, so so the, the point here is supposed to be that um, this theorem had this assumption of having like this small fixed QES subspace. And then it promised us, you know, that capital B could reconstruct operators all the way up to the QES. And you might say, or wonder, do these operators I get actually just reconstruct phi perfectly? Are they just, you know, we had this assumption of fixed QES subspace, but maybe they work outside of that subspace. Maybe they just always work. And this contradicts that. It tells you, no, you've got to be careful. These operators that you're guaranteed reconstruct phi uh, can't work in every state in the CFD Hilbert space. They only work in some subspace, so you should really only take them to be uh, the operator reconstruction in this H code. If you want to start talking about reconstructing operators more generally that work uh, in subspaces larger than this fixed QES subspace, then you're going to have to um, uh, be a little smarter. Maybe have a theorem that doesn't have that restriction placed in it. And um, that's what we're going to do next time, because we're going to realize that there's more to life than fixed QES subspaces. When we have black holes, that's, that's going to be very important, because general black hole states if you have a black hole, different states of the black hole will very often have different QESs. And so if we want to have reconstruction in the context of black holes, we don't want to limit ourselves to fixed QES subspaces. So we're going to have to prove a whole, we're going to have a, have a whole different theorem without this assumption um, to tell us what we can and can't reconstruct. That's next time. Thank you. Okay, maybe we can have one quick question and postpone the rest to the discussion session. So is the HKLL reconstruction different from all of these? Yes, so um, the HKLL reconstruction will in general not allow you to reconstruct all the way up to the, uh, uh, to close to the quantum extremal surface. So, um, Yeah, in general, it's different. I see. So, HKL uses the whole boundary, right? Uh, you can do this Rindler reconstruction to use a subregion, but then the subregion that you are able to use um, has to be quite large relative to what this tells you you can use. Okay. Uh, but what if you use the whole? Yeah. If you use the whole, yeah. If you, want, if, you're, if you want to use the whole thing, 
then um, HKLL will often work just fine. Uh, you, but it won't work for us whenever we um, get it. I didn't mention this, but some contexts that we'll care about are like contexts in which we have the black hole information paradox, where we have, say, um, a bunch of radiation over here. And we want to ask, when can we, say, use this radiation to reconstruct the interior? Or like, when can we use this CFT to reconstruct the interior? And uh, HKLL won't help us do that. But this will tell us that it's possible and give us a different way of doing it. Yeah. OK, let's increase again. And uh, we have a break until 3.30, and uh, so if you, if you can...